All right, happy, happy Thursday. And welcome to the HGAP speaker series. I'm Dr. Eric Youngstrom. I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience and psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I also am the executive director of Helping Give Away Psychological Science. And this speaker series has been made possible with generous support from the University of North Carolina Student Government Association, as well as HCAPS. And I want to give some shouts out to Taylor Steele and Caroline Vincent for securing the funding from student government. Uh, Viraj Garg for doing a wonderful job with the social media and the advertising and to Wilson Jacobs for taking this recording and getting, getting it up onto the YouTube channel as one of our growing offerings. So this is the first of three talks that we have this semester and all of them are on wellness days for those of us who are joining from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So instead of a spring break this year, we have, have days sprinkled through the semester for us to have time to, to regroup, um, get away from Zoom, and, and, and generally, generally take care of ourselves as we get through the semester. So there's a small amount of irony having a talk on a wellness day, but it's getting recorded, so you don't have to, to just watch it today. Uh, but all of the themes that we're talking about this semester are about self-care and support and, and what we're learning about the, the mental health effects of, of social isolation. And, and so this talk is, is going to be a joy, a real treat. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Guillermo Perez Algorda. <clears throat> from Lancaster University. He's joining us from England, from the United Kingdom. Guillermo and I originally met in 2000, I believe in 2004, 2005. He was living in South America. He was working as a full-time clinician in Uruguay and, and working on his PhD at the same time in another country. So he was taking a, a ferry across the Rio La Plata River to work on his dissertation at Buenos Aires and then coming back and seeing patients. And so I got an email saying, Dr. Youngstrom, I'm from Uruguay, a small country in South America. I bet you don't even know where it is. I did have to look at a map to make sure I was right. And, um, and he asked if I could send, send him a, a reprint to, to read. And I sent him a reprint and the next day I had another email from him and he clearly had read it. He's like, I wonder if you could send me this one and this one and this one. And I'm like, sure, okay. And, and I'm blown away at how, how fast he reads in a second language and in between seeing, seeing patients. And, and, and so we started a, a decades long correspondence um, he's become a, a, a great friend, but also one of my most respected colleagues. Uh, Got to be one of the, the smartest people that I've ever met, but definitely one of the nicest people that I've ever met. And, and that origin story of working full-time as a clinician while going back to school to, to get a PhD and coming from, from South America and then doing a postdoc in the United States and now working in England, he has, he gets it. He has a science practice perspective like no other person that I work with. And he thinks about how can, how can information help people's lives globally because, because that's how he has lived his, his life. Um, so this is this I'm getting chills. This is a really, really exciting, exciting talk. He does some of the, the most cool creative work of anyone that I know. Um, so round of applause for, for Dr. Guillermo Perez Algorda. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for your words. Um, I hope you 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 can listen me for okay. Um, I'm sure you you won't notice today my British accent. 
And, and, and the reason of that is the, that's one of the consequences of COVID for, for me. Um, it's a lack of opportunities to interact with native speakers during the past year. Uh, I spend the majority of time at home where I'm speaking in Spanish with my wife, speaking Spanish with my kids. Obviously, they respond in English. Um, and this is the first talk since possibly since a year ago. Um, and one of my concerns is about, oh, well, uh, I'm going to be enough uh, articulated to express what I want to say today. For the reason, if I sound a little bit as a cartoon, please forgive me for that. Um, I'm going to try to, to articulate as much as I can to communicate some ideas and, 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 and think together, right? The, the, the idea is to frame this as a conversation, um, and, and, and exchange, and, 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 and try to, you know, challenge in some way the, our thinking to, to solve important problems that, that we are facing. I'm going to start to sharing the, my slides. Um, one second. It's working. That's better. Okay, where is the rhythm? This is about the daily challenge during COVID time um, and their impact on mental health. Um, and I have three aims today, right? Um, I'm sorry about being a little bit, uh, I would say, the, I, I don't want to tell you what is that particular element that, I, that, that is there, that I want to, to to give you the opportunity to, to discover by yourself what is going on here. But the, the, the aims are to reflect on a consequence, that's the mystery war consequence of COVID that affects everyone in a different way, to review the relationship of this consequence with mental health, and to identify strategies to manage this consequence to prevent mental health issues. Okay, these are the aims. As possibly you know, when presenters open a presentation, they spend a few minutes giving some general um, definitions about the construct, right? But I won't do that today. I, I, I believe we have a, an overdose of information about COVID. We, we are <laughs> quite experts on what it is and what is not COVID. Um, um, and also it's an opportunity to, to introduce uh, uh, an example of one of the great resources developed by HCAP. HCAP, as Eric mentioned before, uh, is a charity that organized in a way that uh, facilitate the collaboration of hundreds of students to develop very high quality information and to make this information open to everybody around the world. And, and, and this is an example that the, 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 the content is located in an in Wikiversity yes. and, um, and, and they have been working on the organization and systematization of information about coronavirus and other, and other epidemics, right? Um, for that reason, I won't spend time defining COVID and things like that. Just sharing this with you because this is a, 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 an example of the type of work that uh, uh, HCAP is doing. When, when I received the invitation to, to, to prepare this talk, um, well, the, the first challenge was, okay, but for whom, right? If, if, if they asked me to, to think about something related with uh, COVID and mental health, but the first reaction was for whom? Because there are many groups with very different needs and living different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I have to spend a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes to, to, with each one of these groups, uh, basically with the aim of uh, 
if I believe some of you are early career uh, students and few, possibly some of you are, are exploring research ideas of, you know, finding a motivation to, 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 to do uh, some, some, some work in the, in the near future. And, 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 and I think this uh, topic of COVID and related with this particular group can, can open opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm going to just describe a few of them. For example, if we if we talk about COVID survivors, I'm, when I'm thinking about COVID survivors, I'm thinking about people that have spent possibly a few months in 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 in, in, in intensive um, in, in, in uh, intensive units in in in, in ICUs, intensive uh, care units, um, possibly receiving very invasive treatments and, and, and really fighting for their life and those lucky to survive those situations, then are facing a very tough time uh, to return to normal life, you know, experiencing uh, symptoms that or today are conceptualized as long COVID symptoms and things like that. But they deserve a special attention and, and, and there are many, many opportunities to, 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 to think about this group of people and, 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 and develop resources for them. Another group that, that is an inter, very interesting group is are those with pre-existing health conditions, right? Uh, as you know, uh, this group of people in particular with uh, uh, respiratory conditions or metabolic conditions um, had a very hard time during the last year because the restrictions were much, much more severe for them in terms of uh, not having the opportunity to contact the, 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 the relatives of the community at all because they were a clear risk for getting COVID and, 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 and develop these clinical manifestations that we, 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 we know. You can think about older people, and, and, and possibly that was the group with the, that had the, the worst outcome, right? Is where we can see the, 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 the bigger number in terms of death. Um, um, and, 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 and there are many psychological uh, 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 elements related with the experience of these older people and COVID that deserve attention, like. You know the the, the spirits of isolation, the, the 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 lack of contact with the the, the loved ones. Um, you can think about those living in care homes, especially in, in countries like here in England. Those, those those people and their families had a very tough time during the last year. Then you can think about those with pre-existing mental health issues, and and, and you can think in particular those experiencing issues where fear of, to the unknown is a, is, is a characteristic for them. You know, those experience anxiety, anxiety type of problems. Well, they, they had a really tough time too. Um, not because the environment in some way was a fire for them in terms of stimulating the, 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 the characteristics of the problems, but also because many of them had problems to access the, the, the type of need that they, 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 they needed, right? The, the, the access to the services that they needed, for example, just to, to, to get a, a regular psychotherapy or whatever uh, um, was, was really difficult for them. Um, you can think about the frontline health workers. These are thousands, thousands of people dealing every day, working under very extreme situations, right? Uh, facing traumatic uh, uh, situations in a daily basis. What, what's going to happen with these people in the future, right? What, what, what we have in place to, to, to provide support to them and to understand the process that, that, that in, in which they are, because they still are, fa are, are, are fighting this, this, this situation. You can find the group of school children and adolescents, for example, that's another group that deserves special attention. 
um, 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 and, and this experience of uh, suddenly stop uh, stopping to attend school uh, and, and start with homeschooling, um, you know, the lack of access to the friends and connections, um, spending more time with parents that possibly didn't have the tolerance that a teacher has to, 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 to provide the support needed to get, you know, the academic uh, uh, training and things like that. Well, those are all the groups. In other words, this uh, situation of COVID is challenged in some way of, of, of the way of thinking in many aspects. And one, one of the opportunities is to, well, which one of the group could be attractive for me as a, as a student to, to really go deep on this and try to come up with some solutions or creative ideas that, to, to help them, right? Um, and then you can extend to other, other groups or circumstances. You know, we know that this uh, situation of COVID has had a differential impact in terms of your in terms of inequalities, right? Those groups that are more disadvantaged, uh, unfortunately, face the, the, the worst outcomes. Um, and, and you can think about uh, ethnic ethnic backgrounds and things like that. That also plays a role in the way that people are experiencing this relationship with this phenomenon that is surrounding us. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to invite you to, to, to do a very, very short sound experiment. Yeah? To do this, uh, I, I would encourage you to just put your speakers or, or, or headphones and, 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 and close your eyes if you want. Um, and let's, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions at, at, at the end, OK? Let's just let's see if this works. Okay, now I'm gonna invite you to ask, answer this, this question or reflect on this. If you, if you want to provide some ideas, use the chat, that, that would be perfect. Um, um, just let's spend a few minutes on this. The first question is, did your comfort level change in front of each of these music segments? Just, you can provide yes or no and just clarify or just go ahead and say whatever you want. The second one was jarring. <laughs> second one, regret buying the CD. <laughs> okay, the sound effect, maybe there was not enough loud. 
the impact of the second one. Yeah. This confirm, yeah, increase with the lack of pattern in the second piece. Okay. How long will you tolerate here in each of those music segments? You spend two minutes listening to them, one minute each one around. Would, would you be able to Yeah, I really could not tolerate the second one. Yeah. The experience of time change depending on what you're listening. That's cool. Like the second one feels longer in some way. Yeah. While listening the second one, the piano, have you tried to identify a regular pattern? Yeah, we, you, you try to put some order there, okay? <laughs> just listen again, just one more time and then keep going. <laughs> And that is the secret problem in some way. Before March, oh, sorry, before March 2020, the rhythm of our life was close to a regular pattern. Yeah. When I say close, as you have seen in the first pattern, there is a clear pattern, but there, are, there is variation too, right? They, they move around, but they come back to the, that particular pattern. After COVID, we are working hard to follow or find a real pattern. I hope you agree with me about this observation. And I want to share some evidence about that. Um, in May 2020, we, we, we collected some data with the aim of uh, study decision making and risk taking behaviors in people related with COVID, right? We collect data from a month from different countries around the world. And one of the questions in the survey was about quantifying, try to quantify the amount of time that people expend on these activities that are here in the box, right? The activities, as you can see, well, have a drink, go for dinner, have a group activity with friends, uh, outdoors, in persons, some visiting family, sport activities in groups, drinks or dinner with friends in a public place. Very, I would say, common, usual activities, right? And as you can see in the uh, vertical axis, you, we asked the, the participants, around 500 people, to say, okay, what, what, what was the amount of time spent on these activities two months before COVID? 
what was among the spend of one week before COVID and during the situation of a lockdown when they were currently on lockdown. And, and as you can see, there was a, yeah, as we know, there's the oils that you know because you were part of this, but visually we can see this pattern. At the same time, new behaviors come up, right? Because possibly related with the uh, experience of working from home or dedicating more, more time in terms of education and things like that. And because we need to connect with people that we were not seeing uh, in person, we start to use new ways of communicating with them. But these patterns in terms of behavioral change are group, uh, uh, they, they reflect group levels patterns, right? It, 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 I think it's an interesting exercise that we can also see this change very clearly at the individual level. This figure represents information collected since December 2019, that is in the vertical axis, uh, until May of 2020. This is a, a single person that was wearing one accelerometer, a, 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 a device like Fitbit or one of these devices that quantify the level of activity and categorize the different level of activities in, in, in terms of no activity, medium activity or high activity. I'm sure you can clearly trace a line where the lockdown started, right? It was around the 12th of March, right? And that's a natural experiment conducted by a single person. If you can replicate this, everybody possibly you have a similar pattern. Yeah, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's evidence of the, the, the modification that we have experienced in a, a year ago, right? Okay, now let's reflect a little bit about this relationship between COVID and mental health. I'm sharing with you here three studies, two of them, uh, one from the United States and one from England, are longitudinal studies based on population data. They collect data in a longitudinal way, but at the level of the population. And they were able to compare data since 2018, for example, in the case of the United States, until 2020, April 2020, when the COVID started. And the same figure applies to the UK study uh, in terms of the population, both about clear conclusion, the level of psychological distress experienced at the population level show an increase when it's compared with previous years, right? But the, we could enter into the details, but it's not my intention to go with the numbers today, especially because these are ref reflecting numbers from the United States and the UK. We don't know what happened in the rest of the world. Possibly the situation were different, I, I was thinking about that in terms of making an estimate if the situation was, was better or worse. I'm not sure because there is an, an important element here that you, you, you need to put into the equation that is the, a factor that is about resilience. Um, and I don't know what happened in, 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 in countries with, uh, uh, with, with less resources countries in terms of the impasse, if they felt this in a, in the similar way. I think it's an open question that we need to come back to this. The third study, the, the, the one that is offered below, is a, is a study with similar characteristics. It's a longitudinal study comparing values from before COVID until the beginning of COVID. But here they are comparing groups of people with and without mental health issues. The conclusions are two main elements there. One is, yes, people with pre-existing mental health issues are having difficulties to cope with COVID, more difficult to cope with COVID than those without mental health issues. But an interesting finding was that uh, those without mental health conditions, with, yeah, they show a, a, a higher relative increase on these issues. In other words, if you compare the increase in amount of problems, the, the group without mental health show the, the biggest increase. 
right? And possibly that is related with something that we call the sailing effect, that those with problems possibly had not so much room to increase the problem. Those without the difficulties have more room to uh, manifest these problems. But the, 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 the idea is that, yes, it, it, it's clear that all this experience related with COVID is, is, is taking, is, is taking uh, 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 and, and it's having a negative impact in our mental health. Um, and something that countries like England are, are starting to do is, is to try to anticipate the future in terms of what is going to happen with uh, this uh, impact, you know, um, and some studies uh, based on data from an area close to where I am now, that is in the Northwest, they are saying that they expect to have a 33% increase in demand of referrals in the during the next three years, right? Um, and I, I just want to ask you to keep this number in mind and then come back at the at the end in the discussion section uh, uh, about the this this element and or, let's say this challenge in, in related with this anticipated increase in the in the number of referrals. Now let's put this piece together. This situation of COVID, alterations of rhythms and mental health. Why they are related? Well, why do these changes could be related with mental health issues? Why these changes in rhythms could be related with mental health issues? And yeah, well, the, the answer is coming from the, this, uh, realization that we are programmed to coordinate our biological, neurocognitive, and psychological process with the planet 24 hours light, our cycle. That's the big rhythm, right? That's the, the, the it's, it's, it's a natural rhythm in which we are immersed. Um, we are, you know, uh, responding to that rhythm. Uh, um, um, and to do that in, a, in, a, in an e efficient way, um, I believe we have uh, developed this circadian system that manifests on all levels in our biological organism, from the tiny cells to tissues to organs to our full body. It manifests in all these levels. And the goal is to engage with this environment to, you know, try to find uh, this, 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 this pattern, this regularity, this rhythm. Um, the good news is that this system is a flexible system, right? Uh, and, and it needs to be flexible because as possibly all of you have experienced it, uh, the environment is not a, is not a constant, right? It, it changed with the seasons here, for example, in the north where I might, the, the, the seasons are extremes. We, we move from a very long summers with very long days summers to very short dates during the winter. Um, it's been a challenge for, in particular for me in terms of my circadian rhythm that was more Mediterranean type of style with the, the variation between days is, is not so big. Um, it is an open system to, to cues to things that are happening around, right? Uh, and one of the most powerful uh, cues is related with light, right? Um, but also it's important, uh, the role of behaviors that the ones that I mentioned three slides before in the box that we were quantifying in terms of change, very basic behaviors like eating, having physical activity or having social activities. Environmental elements plus these behaviors all help us to be, you know, coordinated and, and, and aligned in some way with these uh, 24 hours rhythms that in which we are immersed. But these events sometimes, okay, can trigger a, a, a destabilization of the system. You know, if uh, I, I, Eric is a, a, a great traveler and he used to go to Korea every year. I remember his anecdotes 
about the, the experience of jet lags and how the, those experience manifest in his body. Or we, we, we can think about popular or more popular changes in our daily life related with, for example, the adoption of technology in, in, in our daily habits and how we are bringing with us uh, electric lights to, to situations that possibly shouldn't be there, like when we are preparing our body to fall asleep. Um, um, and those elements can destabilize the system, right? Another proof of this relationship between rhythms and mental health is coming for an observation from a group of people that experience mood problems, right? Um, and some of them very severe mood problems. Um, and it's common to observe in these people marked alterations of these rhythms. And this, uh, these difficulties can happen before, during, and after the experience of these mood difficulties. In fact, this circadian dysregulation has gained the status of being a candidate pathogenic factor of mood problems. That means that some of us believe that part of the explanation of why a group of people in the community are dealing with these difficulties related with mood problems is because they are possibly more sensitive to get this system dysregulated, right? I just put here a, a, an example of war related with this that was very timely led by Eric and, 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 and Alberto Stefano, that, that is a, a, an Italian colleague that is joining Eric's lab in the next month. Um, and, and, and they were working about developing tools to uh, help people with bipolar disorder, a mood, a, a, mood, a mood disorder problem, very sensitive to these dysregulations. I'm, I'm putting this information in the in this wiki journal of medicine and that, that is an open source journal. Um, and you can you can get that information from using the, the, the QR code there and go directly to this paper that expand on these ideas. This relationship between rhythms and mood have opened many hypotheses, right? Not not only one. One of these, one of the hypotheses, and it, and I, I believe it's relevant for us today, is about the role of significant life events, right? Uh, the loss of a job or a death of a relative. Think about those two elements, only those two elements. How common have been those two elements in the past year since COVID? How many people have lost a job? How many people have lost a relative? The reason this period of time has been really, really challenging for many people. Right? Because this, this type of events increase the chances of experiencing these mood problems, right? And the way that they, they develop is kind of a cascade of events, yeah? That, as I said, they, 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 they challenge the synchronization, yeah? And suddenly we are listening to the piano, yeah? uh, and we want, we want to put an order there, but we are finding it really difficult to put an order because the elements that we used to get that order, they are not there anymore. You know, I spent 40 years of my life with my wife, possibly, and suddenly I didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye. And now I'm facing this situation of isolation without that company. Imagine how, how difficult it can be. Mm -hmm. We are lucky in some way that we have been working on uh, interventions informed by these models, right? To regain regularity of timing of behaviors. Yeah, and, and these interventions are interesting because in some way are quite simple. Um, for us that we are in this uh, journey of helping people in terms of their mental health, well, it's good to have some time, simple tools in, instead of complex one. It doesn't mean that the complex one are not good. And it's, sometimes the complex one are difficult to implement and the simple tools are easy to disseminate, right? Um, um, prescribing behaviors like this one, like be careful in terms of having a regular time, 
or being out of bed or just pay attention about having some regular first social contact. What is the time that you are commencing your activities? At what time you are having dinner? At what time you go to bed? You know, that it's, it's a really important areas that we need to explore. And there is some preliminary support to this model and this intervention. But believe me, there, there, still there is a lot of work to do. To, the, to, to confirm this association or to give more validity to this association. And that's in some way a good news for us in terms of uh, 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 that we are doing this, this type of work. These are opportunities for us to uh, dedicate our energy and creativity and our time. Here, I'm, I'm gonna say maybe the, 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 the most important ideas that I want to share with you today. And, and I think the first line represents the, the, the most important and, and is highlighted in red. I think the main challenge for us at the beginning is we need to try to find our personal routine. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit reluctant to the idea that we need to be all aligned to the same type of routine. And sometimes when you get access to this type of to-do list, that you need to do this, 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 and this, I find those lists a little bit difficult because I'm sure that at the time of listening the music, we all react in a different way. We had totally different levels of tolerance to this type of disruption. But what is important is to learn where we are in terms of that threshold of tolerance, right? You can think about specific details, you know, especially if you are a student and you're living in accommodations that are not super fancy because you don't have enough space. Well, you need to think carefully possibly about how to negotiate your space where you are planning to do your activities because you want to, to get a good night of sleep, for example. There are other behaviors that possibly are not only related with rhythms, but are related with your general health. Like for example, have a good dose of vitamin D <laughs> or have a good level of physical activity to, to have a good metabolic system in place, right? Um, sometimes it's just a matter of find a way to identify what type of activity you can do. The last year has been a challenge. I love to play outdoor sports. Haven't been able to do that, especially during the winter. We can think about social connections, dedicate time to relax. And finally, we need to ask for help if we need it, yeah? Here is an example of a resource that HGAP has done that is called the Assessment Center. And it's a really good way, it's a good, get, a good starting point to make sense of possibly many of the experience that you are having today. This is a free resources is anonymous where you can have access to the best of the free instruments around the world to screening the presence of these common difficulties that I was mentioned before, that some of them can be related with your mood, some of them can be related with your eating habits, some of them possibly are related with your child in terms of behaviors and but this is a good example that we can access or invite people that we know are having struggles to get access to this. As I, as I say, as a starting point of a, in a journey that is not easy. You know, we know that it's easy to, to frame the challenge that we are facing in a kind of a negative way, like a pessimistic way. But I think we have the opportunity to reframe this in a positive way, or at least in terms of opportunities. Yeah? Um, and as I say, I think one of the main lessons of the pandemic is the, the, the uh, what, something that is 
teaching us. It's about the importance of learning about our, our lifetime regularity. Because we, we didn't have this situation before, right? Um, and the, the, the interesting thing is, this is an opportunity to respond better in the future. We know we are facing new challenges similar to these. Yeah, I just remember the situation in Texas of a couple of a month ago with a massive storm that has a big disruption in people. Life um, is, is just an example. You have fires around sometimes and that change a lot because you are mobilizing communities. And, and one of the impacts of those mobilizations is in the impact on the rhythms of people. Um, and we, if, we, if we help people to generate resilience in terms of be more resilient in terms of this chrono resilience, let's call it, we, 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 we're gonna be possibly uh, minimizing the impact of, of these uh, negative events. Um, COVID is, is, is helping us to understand that we, we, we are a community of people, right? We are in, in this global situation right now, and, and, and we need to think in that way. Um, and when we are developing some knowledge, as, 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 you, as I know you are doing now, uh, we need to figure out ways of thinking about other people around the world that don't have access to these resources. And there are simple ways. Yeah, age gap is working in some of them. For example, in the translation of resources to different languages, something so easy like that. Yeah, it's just translate resources to facilitate and multiply the access to people from around the world to these resources. Right? COVID is screaming to us, guys. This is a global problem. Local solutions are not enough to fight against them. Yeah, we know that we feel frustrated for that because sometimes people making the decisions uh, don't follow the idea. But we need to raise the voice saying, guys, this is a global problem. You know, whatever is happening in Brazil now. It's going to have an impact on us, yeah. Um, and, and it's easy to say, okay, that that is not happening. Oh no, no, it's what is important is what happened in my town now. Oh, everything is opening now. But yes, but don't forget that this is a global phenomenon. We have done a lot. We don't know the amount of things that we have. Technology scientific advance. We got a, how many vaccines in one year? <laughs> one year, those people in the past, you it take around 10 years to develop this, those vaccines, yeah? But what happened? We still have a simple task that is improve access to those resources, yeah? It doesn't matter that maybe you have the best of the vaccines if you don't have a system that facilitates access. Doesn't matter if we have the best psychotherapy intervention in the world, if people don't have access to that. We need to innovate, find ways to improve what we already have, right? I'm not satisfied with what we have, for example, in terms of mental health. I think we have plenty of things. But I know there are plenty of people that are not responding to the treatments that we have. But if they respond, there is a very high level of recurrence of those problems. Um, I think we need to just keep going, keep going, because again, we just land in Mars and we are driving a car in Mars. Guys, <laughs> we can do better, right? It's a challenge. And we can do better. At the same time, we need to be humble, right? Because we need to recognize what we don't have and possibly we won't have solution for all these problems, right? Um, 
this is a this is this, this idea of the crisis is something that Eric shared with us uh, in one of the wiki wiki pages, and I think is in some way clearly exemplified the, the spirit of this time. Uh, that you know, this is this we need to find a way to 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 make of this an opportunity instead of this crisis as an opportunity, right? Okay, I'm going to stop here. I think we have a few more minutes for questions. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to 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 answer or comments in the chat or, or in the way that you want. So, to <clears throat> so I have I have a couple of quick questions. What the drawings were they were they Nico or Lucia or? Oh yeah, it's it's my daughter's Lucia. Yeah. The um and you didn't you didn't talk about the glasses at all. Well, <laughs> I didn't have time. You want to go to talk about the glasses? I, I I brought mine just in case you. <laughs> yeah, we have been testing with Eric the this the use of amber glasses that they have the capacity to filter out blue light, especially at night or depending or the goal that you are using the glasses as a simple way of facilitating people uh, regularity in sleep you know the, that's that's the idea this is an intervention that we are testing for that 